Well, hello, hello. everybody, and hello, Nate. Hello, Greg. Welcome, everybody watching this on various social media feeds. My name is Nate Swick. I am joined by Greg Neeson. It's time once again for our bi-weekly What's This Bird Live. Uh, we are going to vamp here for a little bit while people kind of settle into their into their seats on the various uh, social media channels that you might be watching this on. Uh, but what we do here is that the ABA maintains a number of Facebook groups, one of which is called What's This Bird? Is it a, it is a friendly bird identification community. Uh, folks take pictures of birds they want to identify. They post them in that group. And then our, our community of members, admins, ABA staff, whoever comes along and helps identify those birds. But what we get here on a regular basis are opportunities to talk through some of those identifications with a little more detail that you can get in a social media format and that's what greg and i are gonna do we come on every other week or so depending on our availability uh and to talk about some of these things um it is it is early march it is officially spring greg how's the birding up where you are is it still Uh, winter where you are no it's well it's it's snowing today or at least it's trying to it's kind of more melting as it hits the ground and um i really I feel bad for the weather folks this winter because in the Great Lakes, because we've had these like massive storm systems come through that threaten, you know, snowpocalypse. And they've just Mm -hmm. kind of fizzled out because of this incredible. I mean, you know, our our viewers in California know (laughs) firsthand. Yeah, they're getting uh, the Pineapple Express there. Yeah, Pineapple Express, Oceanic. uh, What do they what, what do they call it? Oceanic. We got uh, river a lot of words for it um yeah. yeah but you know we are getting slammed with moisture and and crazy weather yeah. coming across the continent and um, by the time it gets to the eastern half of the country it's really unpredictable uh yeah and uh, so i feel bad for the weather guys but um last week we had the first like big unlimited blue dome sky day warm mm. um and uh, I heard that atmospheric river, river, Devana G- uh, Gentry river. said, atmospheric river. Yes, thank you. Um, and so we had this, the, you know, unlimited blue sky day, warm south winds, and the sandhill cranes took off. And I, so I, I, I played hooky and went out in the yard and sat there with my camera for a little while, and I counted forty two hundred cranes going over my backyard in two hours. It was this is Chicago nice. land too. It's not exactly what you think of when you think of crane habitat, but the cranes are are moving up the lakeshore, yeah. They they well they just they skirt around the downtown portion of the city most of the time, especially in spring. Um, but you know, if you're a little bit west of the city as I am, I'm nine miles west of the lake. Um, in that sort of zone between nine and 25 miles west, the cranes come through, you know, in tens of thousands on the right day. And mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's just, it's an amazing spectacle that I never, ever get tired of. That's nice. Uh, down where I am in the Southeast, it is wet. It is just wet and drizzly and kind of cold and muddy and nasty, but the birds are singing. Uh, I stepped outside yeah. my, my house today and, you know, Northern Cardinals are in full song. The Robins are singing. The House Finches, all my kind of neighborhood birds are out and about, and they're louder than they have been in some time. So spring is definitely on its way. I don't have any, any Abs- migrants yet, any like real migrants, uh, we- some of the early stuff like blue gray gnatcatcher or, or stuff like that. But um, it, well, it's, I mean, it's we- coming. I'm probably only a week away or so. Yeah, I mean, our, um, you know, we, we're definitely, like you said, the cranes, those are definitely migrants, but they're, mm-hmm. you know, they, they winter so close now that when they decide to take off, it's just, boom, we get them in a matter of hours. You know, people right. in northern Indiana are like, hey, cranes are moving. Like, I'll go out an hour later. Oh, there they are. But they like are. driving <laughs> past the local baseball diamond, it was covered in American robins, which it wasn't yeah, they're, a week they're and flocking a half big ago, time right now. You know, yeah. so they're moving in. Um, just want to shout out to uh, some of our friends yeah, on Facebook. So Chris Ortega, Buddy Campbell, Mia, good to see you. Good to see you hey, last Mia. night on the uh, ABA first ABA webinar in ABA community, um, which a bunch of you, uh, it was good to see some familiar faces in there. Um, familiar and, names, uh, at least, if yeah, not faces. Familiar <laughs> names, that's right. You couldn't yeah. see any faces, but we didn't see that. Yeah. <laughs> see the names as, uh, you know, the, uh, the participants couldn't see each other, but we could see you and uh, see your names anyways. And um, 
Oh, it went off. It went off really well. We had a good, a good crowd, and uh, you know, Ted Ted Floyd is such a an amazing speaker. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, he talked about the recent uh, Southern Ocean Antarctica expedition that he was on in November with uh, an ABA tour with Katinka Doman and uh, a whole bunch of other. They had two hundred birders on a ship, um, and he said it was just amazing. Uh, so. That uh, the recording of that uh, for ABA members, the recording of that will be available at some point soon. I don't know exactly when. There's some work that has to be done before it's available, and uh, I will get to that as quickly as uh, as we can and make that available to ABA members at ABA Community, ABA.org/community. Go in there, and this will be. Only the first of what we hope will be a regular uh, series of webinars throughout the rest of the year and, and ongoing. ongoing. Um, I'm actually going to be uh, kind of in charge of putting those together. So uh, you're going to hear from some people that you might have heard about on the podcast. You're going to hear from some people that you might hear about have having written some things for the ABA's publications, Birding Magazine and North American Birds. I think there's a lot of opportunities, kind of cross-promotion, cross-pollination with those folks. But um, if you out there have heard a particularly good bird presentation either at your local Audubon chapter or at state Audubon or provincial Audubon, not Audubon, bird club, whatever, any of those things, uh, please drop me a line at uh, nswick at aba.org. Let me know. We're going to be looking for people to fill those slots. Uh, we've, we're going to be calling on friends of the ABA. Uh, one of the great things about being associated with this organization is that pretty much every serious birder, uh, notable birder in uh, North American continent and, and increasingly around the world has uh, is a is a friend of ours and we'll be bringing them in to uh, to give talks on things that they're interested in or experts on and so that will be uh, that will be fun so keep an eye out for those uh, every couple months or so we'll be we'll be working on that schedule soon a couple more a couple more uh, shout outs to our friends on Facebook Alba from Thunder Bay Ontario hello Canada um, and uh, Jill. Uh, sorry, things are jumping here. Jill White Smith um, and my homeboy Matt Aglesky is in the house. Uh, and, I can do some uh, yeah, some YouTube th thanks. We've got uh, Scott Hickman, Dave yeah. Bond, uh, Tracy Hinchbarger, folks we've seen before, Rob Liptak, Andrew Kambauer, uh, the boss Nikki Belmonte. She's watching on uh, Facebook, so uh, everybody oh. everybody look tight. Uh, uh, keep you. We'll keep. Uh, we'll we'll do a. We'll run a tight ship here. Um, hello to everybody who's watching. Um, we'll we'll get to the birds. I think we've. I think we've we've got almost a hundred people on YouTube. Uh, Greg, All right we've on. got a number of people watching on Twitter and in Facebook as well. Shall we? Shall we jump on to the to the meat of the conversation? Shall we talk some I, birds? I think we can. Let me uh, let me push the button. So uh, the yeah, button. our first bird. Our first bird comes from Monroe County, Florida. And, yeah, this um, was a really interesting photo, really interesting conversation uh, that happened today. I, I saw this one on saw this one this morning. So uh, yeah, to, uh, bring us up to speed on that conversation. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at uh, a fairly decent sized bird. It's got very long, pointed wings, relatively slight body. Can't really tell much of what is going on with the head there. It's got, I guess, it's light light colored lighter than the body itself um on first glance there's some things that really make me think raptor on this bird the sort of broad long wings uh the pointed wings i you know there's only a handful of birds that are like that uh swallows kites falcons swifts um it doesn't really fit any of the smaller ones um but the sort of the broad wings with the uh with the long pointed wings it says uh it says raptor to me so i'm thinking immediately of uh, falcon or or kite on this bird. It it I I agree with you 100. percent And I would add one more bird to um, yeah, let's do the it. sort of flying cross list, and that's Anhinga. And, Anhinga, um, yeah. You know, Anhinga Osprey. Would have a, Should we do Osprey too? Let's throw uh, yeah, that in there. As yeah, well. throw that one in there. But um, Anhinga would have Florida. a very long neck um, that would be apparent in this photo. However, when they soar really high, and they do soar like hawks, and they yeah. can they can really look like hawks because especially the females have very pale heads and chests compared to the body and the head can just disappear in the sky because you know uh, it's it absolutely so, light can, it's so to thin the the yeah yeah um so yeah let's um let's yeah let's go so to the next sorry slide, i got a call on my this... phones 
Yeah. What's that? Go ahead. I got a call on my headphones. It is. <laughs> my, uh, Sorry, we're why busy. I paused there for a second. I was staring at the, the screen like an idiot. Um, yeah, you only do one thing at a time. Uh, so, yeah. Um, here's here is the burden question in the center with um, mm. really the two or you know two most obvious choices for Florida, um, mm -hmm. and that is a a young peregrine falcon on the left and a Mississippi kite on the right. And, yeah, um, for sure. And I think a lot of the people when they first when that photo first came up, they immediately thought falcon, which is, which certainly makes sense uh, when you see a bird like this with the pointed wings as as it has. But when you look at that falcon there, you can see the peregrine falcon. Um, even though the wings are pointed, they're they're still really broad. Uh, and this bird in question has extremely sort of narrow wings for a for a raptor. So what are you calling it? I'm calling it a Mississippi kite. I'm calling it a you young Mississippi so? kite. I I can count on uh, many, many hands the number of times that I've seen a Mississippi kite flying overhead. My first thought has been uh, falcon. That's falcon, uh, like a like kestrel or a merlin. But um, I'm not I'm not seeing any of that on there. Um, those sort of very long, narrow wings, the dark underbody. Uh, it just it gives me a very kite esque uh, vibe. Uh, though it's, I admit it's sort of difficult to tell. My my guess is Mississippi kite on this bird. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on this one. Oh my um, goodness! Right yeah, off the bat, yeah, because I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing a young peregrine falcon here. Um, I, you know, you can you can see a little bit of dark on the face, the mustache, um, and I you know this is this this image has a lot to be desired, and yeah, uh, the, the the caveat yeah. that we will say every single time here on this program is identifying a bird from a photo from a like this or photo. a single photo yeah. is much more difficult than yeah. identifying the bird in person when you this see is it definitely a bird that if we exactly if we saw it in person if we were standing right next to each other and we saw this bird fly over i don't think that we would disagree at all we would immediately know whether it's right. a falcon or a mississippi kite but given so, this sort of image it's um yeah it's hard to say the one thing, the one thing that stands out to me, well, a couple of things. One is how the 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 the, the underwing coverts are darker than the rest of the wing, um, mm -hmm. which young kites don't show and adult kites never show. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing uh, is the primary tips. Um, I can see the two outermost primary feathers, number ten, kind of sticking up there. And kites number ten is, you know, two thirds the length of number nine, and and it's you can see that little bulge on the Mississippi kite in the right. You can see that little bulge in the primaries, which is actually the outermost primary. It's shorter um, than the than the one next to it. And lastly, Mississippi kites. Now again, when their tail is folded like this, it's hard to tell, but Mississippi kites almost always show this little gentle curved outward splayed shape to the to the tail um so i'm i'm for me this is a young peregrine falcon but if i could buy another... that it's a falcon i i'm having a hard time making it into a peregrine just because peregrines are such beefy boys and this bird is definitely not that now do you have it do you have an image of an american kestrel could you throw an american kestrel up there because i could uh, buy an american boy, kestrel for this bird i you know i don't um i American kestrel just didn't enter my mind. The, it just the wings look, it the wings look too long. Um, I don't know. They have pretty long wings. Uh, Tim Callback notes: If it's a falcon or a kite, what is going on with that head bill? Uh, the fuzzy resolution. Why do we see the bill much? Why do we see the bill? Why does the head project so much? Yeah, fair question. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I'll be honest. The more I, the, when it, my first gut reaction of this bird was Mississippi kite, but the more I, I think about it and talk about it, the less I'm, con the less I'm sure, ugh, the less I'm certain about anything. That's <laughs> yeah. what this thing is. <laughs> well, uh, I think it. We're probably just going to have to leave it at that. Because maybe and, so. Uh, for all of you, maybe for all so. of you watching, um, as I like to say so often, birding is hard. Birding is hard. <laughs> birding is easy. Birding is hard. Um, okay, we're gonna move. I say on birding is easy. Birds are hard. <laughs> Birds are hard. Yes. Um. Yeah. We can't really see the. Um. Heidi McCulloch yeah. says, you know, it. Boy, the the image is just so. 
it's 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 so blurry. It's we blurry really in all see. the wrong places. It is, and you know, the, and the other, you know, the other thing. And Matt says, of course, Florida. Um, you know, yeah, one right. of the other things I saw immediately was the dark axolars, the wing linings. I thought, oh, maybe a prairie falcon, which is slimmer yeah. than yeah, is slimmer oh, than I agree. a peregrine. That crossed my mind um, as well. But but prairie falcon sh- usually shows two toned underwing um linings and you know with with definite black wing pits and and kind of darker as they go out um which could be yeah. here it's hard to tell because the image and i tried and i tried playing with um the the levels on this photo to see if i could pull anything out and I, it just it degraded too much to where you couldn't really tell very yeah. much um steve huggins also one of my homeboys from chicago um and a uh, very accomplished professional guide uh, it says peregrine falcon, but need more picks. So, um, and Tim says, yeah, maybe we should be considering Siberia. I mean, reference. falcon, I'll, Which... <laughs> falcon, I'll, I'll, like, I'll buy falcon. Like I said, it's just peregrine. I have a hard time. I have a hard time making that into a peregrine. Oh, I, I mean, I, I agree. You look at the, you look at the, um, uh, you look at the peregrine to the left, and that is classic, beefy, thick, wide falcon. Yeah, that's what um, I think of when I think of fal- peregrine falcons. I, yeah. I I agree, um, but you know, this could be a a young bird with a full crop, which is kind of accentuating that slimness Fair. and that, that yeah. kind of thick, heavy chest. And the angle, I don't think this bird is directly overhead. I think it's in the distance and coming at us a little bit more than the two comparisons yeah, maybe so. that I have. I, but I mean, we could talk about all the we could talk about this for another hour. Yeah, there's um, a million reasons why this photo is subpar. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> uh, Solament TV's on uh, YouTube says, "Miss the intro. Why isn't this a Merlin?" Um, yeah, good question. I, I, I ex- would expect that the pattern, the pattern on the underwings is a little weird uh, for is. Merlin, and Merlin mm-hmm. is a very uniquely shaped uh, falcon as well. You know, there yeah. we talk about Peregrine being a beefy boy, but Merlin is is very chunky as well with a really big I- head. And uh, relatively short wings uh, for a yeah, falcon, and of, the, the length of these wings doesn't feel right. The first, the first thing I think of when I think of Merlin is compact and fast. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Um, even when even when soaring, which they don't do that often, but you know, even mm-hmm. when soaring in migration, they still look compact, fast, and you know, they look like sports yeah. cars more than this bird does. Um, yeah, like a, almost and, like a uh, purple martinish kind of look. You know, kind exactly. of very broad wings uh, at the body, broad based wings, and and yeah, as you say, sort of a short tail. This is this is a very lanky bird, and yeah, you know, maybe spring peregrine. Maybe it's I, I don't I don't know I don't know, Greg. I don't know why are you throwing these at us right off the bat. Well, you know, it was the first one in the queue, so there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Alan Van Veen watching from Guyana, right on. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, how are you down there? And um, yeah, no, it's definitely, definitely not a frigate bird. Um, yeah, this is yeah, just no one of those birds. Bird. We throw one of these in every once in a while. This is one of those birds that yeah, kind of just got to leave it with who knows, you know. I, yeah, I can't can tell. Nail, can't tell. You, you just can't DVD. really nail it down. Um, and that that happens. So That happens. We're going to move on here. Let's move on to some easier ones, Greg. Ah, uh, this one, when I saw it, I love it because... You're needling you know, me with this. This is, this is this a is yard a, this bird. This is a nemesis bird for me. Is it really? This was a yard bird it for is. somebody. And my first thing I thought was, how wonderful to have this as a yard bird. Yeah, no joke. Um, So uh, what, what do we got? Uh, well, uh, this is a very chunky bird with uh, big, strong feet and legs. It's got a, a relatively small head with a short, curved bill. Yeah, it looks like nothing if not a chicken, Greg. It's a very chickeny bird. That's a chicken, but it's not a chicken. It's not a chicken either. Well, it kind of is. That's, I guess in the we same family, chickens, the Galliformes you know, families, every, the, the you know, game every, bird family. Every uh, every birding tour company does an April chicken trip, <laughs> looking for. Uh, hey, if like this bird this, were so yeah. if this bird was uh, was uh, reasonable on those trips, they would probably call it a chicken. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, so, you know, a couple of things stand out here. And one is we got that little crest that we can see. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's got like a black patch on the back of its neck um, and a broad yep. black tail band. Um, broad black tail band. Yep. And um, 
Yeah, and 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 those those three things really you, you go through the chicken shaped birds, especially in New Hampshire. Um, mm -hmm. Those three things really add up to one species, and that is ruffed grouse. Ruffed wood... grouse. Yes, and uh, yep. just a wonderful bird. They're starting to drum right now, which is one of those odd sounds that it's it's such a low um uh it's at such a low um not decibel level what's the word i'm looking for again i had a little too much coffee so my brain is like short, <laughs> short circuiting short circuiting this morning this <laughs> but anyways, I should say. it's it's it you feel it more than you hear it yeah yeah you know it's like yeah. little... it's a it's a percussive sound so what they do is they take yes. their they take their wings and they go Foom, foom, like against their frequency. body and like, thank you chris ortega yeah, it is that it is, is that um for. pounding it's that compressing the air that causes the the sound that they make and then they just kind of ramp it up a little bit a little bit a little bit faster every time until it's just like a and then they stop it's a, yeah. a really unique i mean the north american grouse uh all grouse in general but we have we are uh we are we are doing very well with grouse in uh, North America. We have a lot of really good ones. Uh, red, this is one of our probably more widespread species across the North American continent. They come all the way down in North Carolina where I have, I have missed them. And um, yeah, Donna Shulman has no spruce grouse in New Hampshire this time of year. Spruce grouse would potentially be a possibility. Uh, grouse are sort of known for this, um, this sort of behavior. They, they are notoriously, there's a lot of colloquial names for them, like fool chicken and, and, you know, basically, yeah playing on the fact that they will walk right up to you and not seem to be paying any attention, which is odd for a, a bird that's hunted across much of its range. But well, um, yeah, why isn't this a, why is this a spruce grouse? Well, and right? I was just going to add, and especially this time of year where grouse are full of uh, hormones and they will actually attack people just like um, yeah. Uh, yeah. turkeys and they'll come out and, and go after you if you're in their place. Um, mm -hmm. Spruce grouse, spruce grouse is overall a, a grayer bird. It's yeah. more barred underneath, um, mm -hmm. and it has white. Now the female is browner, um, and and is barred all over. Like you, you see a mm -hmm. female spruce grouse, and it just has um, this this kind of overall barred look. It doesn't have that big black patch on the back of the neck, um, yep. and it doesn't show that little crest uh, yep. that the that the uh, ruffed grouse shows. In a lot of parts of the range, another uh, possible confusion species for rust grouse are uh, young turkeys, young wild turkeys, yeah. uh, poults, as they as they are growing into their you know the adult size. You know, uh, you're not going to confuse an adult wild turkey with a rough rough grouse with adult wild turkey. Uh, wild turkeys are massive; they're enormous. But you know, as they're growing, there's an age when they are uh, looking very similar to rough grouse, and they they also have the bar on the tail. So if you accidentally flush one. Yep. Um, you'll see that so that kind of telltale telltale sign uh, of the bird flying away, but um, that's that's a very brief period when that is a possible it confusion, is, and, and, they, and not for a while, not not certainly not in March. It's still a little early for the yeah. For the wild and they turkeys. tend to look, you know, the turkey poults tend to look a little more awkward. They're leggier. They have more yeah, neck. They are leggier, and they just, for sure. They look, yep. you know, they look like like teenagers. They're just kind of awkward. <laughs> and, but the, but one thing that really really messes with people's minds, um, and this is such a wonderful evolutionary adaptation, is that most young grouse turkeys can fly at a very young age. Like mm -hmm. you you wouldn't think that a bird that young could fly because um, they roost up in the trees with their parents, yeah. and so you see you know a turkey that's one third the size of its parents, and they all take on I mean, it or you don't even see the parents, you know, and they fly. You're like, whoa, what yeah. the heck is that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and and usually right. wild turkeys are sort of a like a plainer, plainer brown, not as rich, rufousy brown as, as these yeah. sort of um, rough grass. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the pattern on this bird is Colorful easy bird. to see. Yeah. yeah, I think Mia says, you know, there's something like 12 days old, old when they can fly. Yeah, it's and ridiculously I, I think that early. About right. Yeah. But um, I think in one of the, uh, um, in one of these, programs that we did a few months back we had somebody that caught a photo of a of a like 12 day old ruffed grouse flying across a trail and no, it was really. it was one it's of the like most a rail or something yeah, yeah it, it, you know what it was it was really a bewildering photo um but there were but there were giveaways okay this picture um good one from, talked from about Colorado this with ted Springs. on the podcast not that long ago 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, it, people identified this one right away, um, but I, I included it just because it's a nice it photo. is very rare that you can see these two species compared side by side um, mm -hmm. the way that they are here. Uh, and so I cut to the chase. These are wax wings. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in the back, we have the larger and more uncommon in the ABA area, Bohemian waxwing. And in front, we have the more common cedar waxwing. Yeah, um, at least more common and, where people live. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> Bow and, Bowings so, are look, probably quite abundant in places where there are no people. Why don't you <laughs> run us through people. the differences here? Yeah, so uh, the size stands out immediately on this bird, and that even though the uh, it's it, even though the fact that the the smaller bird is the front bird, you would think that even if the they were closer in size, that wouldn't be so obvious. Um, there's some other things. the The pattern on the wing there on the Bohemian in the back is a little more ornate, I suppose. Uh, cedar mm -hmm. waxwing has that. You can see this the wax tips on the cedar waxwing, which is very cool. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's mostly just a plain gray and brown wing, whereas the um, the Bohemian waxwing has that kind of neat yellow and white and black pattern on the wing tip uh, that is most obvious when the wing is folded and there, and, and as you can see there. And also, uh, what I think is sort of interesting here, you always hear about Bohemian waxwing being a sort of a grayer brown. Um, that's a mm -hmm. sort of a difficult thing to tell here. They look uh, rather similar, but you can tell the, the gray on the rump of that Bohemian waxwing creeps up a lot farther up oh, onto yeah. the back than it does in the cedar waxwing in the front. So if you're looking at a bird that's flying away, uh, that's something that's going to stand out a little bit. And look at all the yellow on the underside of the cedar waxwing, whereas there's very little yellow, no yellow on the underside of the Bohemian waxwing. No, it's very gray. And of course, very gray, the, the rusty, pale, the rusty yep. chrysum um, or undertail coverts uh, mm -hmm. stand out. Oh yeah, you can uh, see that as well. Yep. Um, and and also. You know, if you're looking at these birds head on, um, Bohemian Waxwing has this sort of chestnut blush to the, the front part of the face mm -hmm. that goes a little across bit of that. Yep. Be between the eyes and the throat. Um, and that also stands out. And just also, Bohemian is just a thicker, beefier, chunkier bird. Yeah, it makes sense for a bird that spends its time in the uh, farther to the north. Uh, I forget, it was Bergman's Law that animals in the uh, colder temperatures tend to be larger and uh, more massive than animals that are found at, at warmer temperatures. You can see that usually that's within a species, not uh, you mm -hmm. know with different species, but you can see it very well with these, uh, these wax wings here. Is it Bergman's right. rule? I don't think it's a law. I think it's just a rule. I'm remembering, I'm forgetting my uh, freshman. So this one, this one here. comes from Wellsville, New York. Um, I think everybody mm, can identify these as swans. Yeah. So we'll Big, just leave it at that. White birds, on. long <laughs> necks, long thin necks, large, large, massive black bills. Swans. Matt Gleski confirms that it is Bergman's rule, not law. Bergman's rule, not a law. Thank you. Yes. He's good for that kind of information. Um, so, Bergman thanks you. Yeah. So I, I think that... Um, because the bodies of these birds all kind of look to be about the same size, um, we can kind of tell they're, they're the same species, uh, yep. I, I believe. Um, you know, the, the, if, if uh, we have two adults and an immature in the middle with their heads up, um, if the, the immature bird, we, I mean, we, can, we can eliminate mute swan from the adults because they don't have orange bills with the classic yep. knob on the front and the fact that the immature bird is is the same size as the bird next to it we can eliminate that as a mute swan as well because mute swan is yep. noticeably larger uh yeah it's a big swan <laughs> it's a big chunky bird one of the heaviest flying birds in the world um mm -hmm. so so let's let's compare the two that it are, are in question here and that is um tundra swan and trumpeter swan now, being in Wellsville, New York, um, really kind of leans heavily towards tundra because trumpeters are still kind of rare in the east, but they are moving all over the place. They are increasing um, rapidly. Yes. So, so here we have um, David Sibley's excellent illustration um, of trumpeter and tundra swans, and. Yeah, you know, the thing that stands out to me the most is on these adults, and you can even see it in the immature bird, is mm -hmm. how 
the eye is almost separated from the bill. Yeah. There's a yep. very narrow band of black connecting the eye to the bill. Yeah, and we pinched. can also, see, yeah, it's very pinched. And you can see the, the rounded forehead on the bird on the mm -hmm. right. Now, if you look at Sibley's illustrations, the top one ah, is a little more ambiguous than they often are. But I think he does that on purpose because there's a lot of variation but there in the is. two, in the middle and bottom illustration, you can really see the difference. He illustrates it very well, especially mm -hmm. the bottom most one. You look at the difference between the shape of the black of, of the bill where it joins the eyes, um, and you can see how the tundra on the left is has a rounded forehead and and doesn't mm -hmm. have the widow's peak, and uh, how the eyes are separated, kind of with this little pinched black, just the way we see on the photo. There. Yeah. A lot of times in the East, you will see uh, trumpeter swans, which are have been introduced in the Great Lakes. Uh, well, they were extirpated in the uh, what, 1800s, early 1900s, um, as were you know many species. And they would have been brought back recently, uh, relatively recently, I should say. It's been 30 years, I suppose, um, mm -hmm. into those places where they were extirpated. They've, they've reintroduced them, and they've, they've actually done very, very well. So people in the East are seeing trumpeter swans in more places and frequently within flocks of tundra swans, which actually makes it easier because trumpeter swan is a, it's a, it's, it, you know, you're looking at them in your field guide. You think that these are birds that are very, very similar, but if you see them in the field together, uh, the differences are pretty, a pretty outstanding. Trumpeter swan is a bigger bird. It's about, you know, 30% yeah. bigger than a tundra swan. And that sort of difference really does stand out quite a bit. Um, and it uh, sounds different too. So if you hear yes. a trumpeter swan, you'll definitely know it. They Absolutely. don't call him trumpeter. Uh, they don't call him trumpeter for nothing. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you know, any, any large group of swans I'm as in that area, I'm definitely going to think it's mostly going to be tundra swans unless I am um, proven otherwise, because you know, there are a lot of trumpeters around, but there there aren't nearly as many of them. Tundra swan overwhelms them uh, in many parts of the East. Uh, but as you yeah. say, Greg, um, I, I have seen tund uh, tundra swans with kind of a little bit of a wider uh, eye allure, um, but it's never as kind of big as you see in a, in a trumpeter swan. Um, you could, that, that profile in the bird in the back um, in the left is, is a really classic tundra swan look. That yes. pinched eye, you can see the eye very well. You frequently can't see the eye very well in a, in a trumpeter swan because the face all kind of blends in together. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I it, Sibley, again, just does such a great job with these kinds of comparisons and sort mm -hmm. of catching the, uh, illustrating the gestalt Um and in this one illustration, he, he kind of shows all the variation and like what you might see and how mm -hmm. as the bird moves its head and feeds and the heads up and down, you see it yeah. from different angles. And, you know, again, as it, as it shows that the tundra swan at the top left is really kind of the, I think, more of the extreme one end compared to the the trumpeter it's got swan a big bill right. for a tundra swan yeah it, it does and and the 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 black space um the lores as they're called between the eye and the mm -hmm. bill is a little bit on the wide side but then in the illustrations below it he he illustrates the the more of what we're talking about and mm -hmm. as the birds move around you can see you can see that and um like as they with so many have... birds yeah, they kind of have a different um, way of moving to. I, this is, and this is just, you know, your mileage may vary. I know a lot of people have seen a lot more trumpeter swans than I have. I've seen them a handful of times. They've become annual here in the southeast uh, among the big flocks of of tundra swans. So there's something you're kind of looking for. Um, they frequently hold their necks a lot straighter too. I don't know if this is like a regular thing. They like the it'll be a like a you know vertical, whereas a you know tundra is going to be a little more curvy. Uh, yeah. kind of that classic swan pose you can see a little bit here that's not anything cut and dried i would not take that to the bank entirely it's sort of a general thing um you know if you're trying to use a bunch of different field marks and, and tie them together to get yourself an identification it's not something i would rely on if that's the only thing you're seeing but um yeah if it's part of the whole gestalt of the bird then it's a, a thing you might notice yeah and and just one more thing about tundra swans or i'm sorry trumpeter swans um, that you kind of uh, mentioned early on is, you know, this is a bird that was almost extirpated. And um, mm -hmm. the, in the East. 
They're still in fairly the common in the West. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, even, you know, back in the day, there were very few places. Yeah, I remember going to Malheur uh, in the 70s in Oregon, yeah. specifically looking for trumpeter swans because that was one of the only places you could find them hmm. um, anywhere in the con- anywhere in the 40- lower 48. Um, but now through reintroduction efforts, they have become pretty common in the Great Lakes. Uh, yeah. And I was, I worked at Lincoln Park Zoo um, during the years that like, they, in Chicago, where they were one of the, the zoos working with the reintroduction program. Um, and I was there for the last release, the, the very last mm-hmm. release, which I think was in 2004 um, in Western Illinois. And one of the birds that we released was the very first recorded nesting of released birds, which was on the oh, upper Mississippi cool. National Wildlife Refuge. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's um, the, the the trumpeter swans, and since then, they're all over the place. I mean, they nest in the Chicago metro area now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I remember we go up to to biggest explosive. week of American birding in the spring, and you can see them at uh, at the uh, wildlife refuge there, Ottawa Wildlife Refuge. Um, there are trumpeter swans hanging out. I I remember thinking that was wild the first time that I that I went to biggest week because uh, yet like you, I had to go all the way out west to get my lifer trumpeter swan at. Um, uh, Grand Tetons, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, we do have a question. Uh, H- Heidi McCulloch notes in um, in uh, in Facebook. Uh, we used to be delighted to see a dozen trumpeters at Lost Bluffs. Now there are hundreds during migration. So yeah, if you're looking for a little uh, rays of sunlight in bird conservation, waterfowl is definitely a place to a place to find them. Yeah, trumpeter um, Pat Burton asks, is... can you compare size of mute swans since everyone is pretty familiar with them? Mute swans are bigger than both of our native swans, aren't they? Mute swans are uh, chunky mute, and mute, mute swan and trumpeter yeah. are really close, but both of those. I guess I are... think of them as more massive, like they're bigger around than yeah. uh, trumpeter swans are. Yeah, uh, but they're but they're both considerably larger than um, than tundra swans. And uh, if you have I, an old if you have an old field guide, it might it would be called whistling swan. Yes, and. Um, I, I, I wish I had a little trumpeter. more time to put this together because uh, last fall, I think, or maybe the fall before, I had a, a flock of uh, 13 swans fly over my house that was uh, mostly tundras, but it had two trumpeters in there, and they were oh, at cool. a distance. And you could really see the, you difference, see the difference in size, in size. and shape. Yeah. Um, you know, just the, 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 the way the t- uh, trumpeter is just more massive. Um, That's cool. Yeah, and Matt Igleski, uh in the comments on Facebook makes a good point. He says there are some trumpeters that sort of show the U forehead rather than the mm-hmm. obvious V, and um, yeah, that's where it's it's um, you have to take into consider the whole uh, into consideration the whole package. Um, yeah, you know, you know sometimes stalk. tundras have another thing. Sometimes tundras have a little bit of yellow in the lore as well. Um, and that's a you know a pretty s- simple way to tell them apart because when you're looking for trumpeters among a flock of tundras, you're looking for the black billed ones. But there's also black billed tundra swans, so then you've yeah. got to you know look for the other things as well. Yeah, and and you know depending, uh, uh, I don't know I don't know exactly what the variation is if it's if it's geographic or whatever, but some uh, tundra swans show a lot of yellow at the at the base mm-hmm. of the bill. Yeah, quite a bit. And yeah. and others show zero, as you said. Yeah, in fact, the the old world subspecies of uh, tundra swan. It's a whole Arctic species. It's found throughout yeah. the northern hemisphere. Uh, the old world one is called Buick Squan. Buick Squan. Buick Swan, not Buick Squan. Um, yeah. Uh, it, 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 you see them in Alaska sometimes, and they have a, they have a lot of yellow uh, in their yeah. face. It's it's really neat. In fact, we had one in North Carolina a few years ago. All righty. So we are going to go from swans. And just um, a quick point here. Uh, those of you in the comments, we are watching. And uh, if you have any questions or anything that uh, you'd like to bring up with us, just drop it in the comments. We will do our best. Um, I was just going to say so- that, Greg, because uh, we, we kind of moved on beyond it, but I want to touch it before. Christopher Dean uh, asked a fellow birder of mine said that wax wings are attracted to running water. Um. Yeah, I mean, a lot of birds are attracted to running yeah. water, especially in the winter when in places where running water is hard to come by. Uh, it's one of the best ways to attract birds to your to your house in the winter is have running water, especially when all the water around you is frozen. Um, and so that could be what that birder is talking about. But you know, it's yeah, running water is always a good always a good thing to have in your feeding station if you can if you can manage it. So. Um... 
<laughs> yeah, you know, Matt, Matt, my yeah. my friend Matt, who's being uh, um, quite talkative in this uh, chat box today. Um, yeah, he says pick another one, an easy one like yeah, Savannah Sparrow versus as a Little guest. Bunting. Yeah, we may someday. Um, yeah, we had it. We had a thing that that happened, which happens fairly commonly in what's this bird, where somebody posts a picture of a rare bird. It could be rare locally. It could be rare continent wide. Um, and they don't know what it is, and there's some discussion about the ID, and it's discovered to be a really rare bird. Well, that happened a week or two ago um, in What's This Bird, where there was a little bunting in Pensacola, Florida. Um, mm -hmm. That was, you know, the discussion between um, Savannah Sparrow and Little Bunting went back and forth and back and forth, and finally the person posted more pictures of it, and it was yeah, better pretty, pictures. That was the key. It was pretty obviously <laughs> not a, a Savannah yeah. Sparrow. And you know what? In in my haste to get this together, I was going to put that bird in and just talk about that bird a little bit. Maybe next time I will do that. Um, I just forgot it in my haste to put this program. Hey, I my when I saw that when I saw that image, Matt, I thought it was a Savannah Sparrow, too. That was my gut reaction. Well, but if be if no, for no other reason, because I, I did not consider little bunting at all. And the photo was taken clearly with an iPhone, like zoomed in. And so yeah. they held these weird kind of artifacts and it was pixelated to hell. And it was a yeah. very difficult photo to discern it. But kudos to the birders that, you know, noticed the right things and, and stuck to their guns on it. Because when the good photos yeah. did come the next day, it was very clear that it was, it was a little bunting and, and not a, a Savannah Sparrow, which was yeah, obviously a first for Florida, first for the whole Eastern half of the continent. So, yeah. Good um, on y'all. Shout out all Andrew right. Gutenberg. Everybody loves owls. Arlington, Texas. Why is this an owl, Greg? Oh, come on. Look at it. Are we going all the way back? <laughs> but I mean, what else could it be? <laughs> yeah. Big dark eyes forward facing the round heart shaped face. Yeah. It's an owl. Ah, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, there's there's um, in Arlington, Texas, like there's there's a few species of owls, um, especially this time the, of year, especially this time of year. The person the person who um, posted this picture said that they felt it was too big for a screech owl. And Bear? judging by the size of the branches and everything we can see, I would kind of agree with that. Um, yeah, a, a screech owl That would have to be a very small tree could almost fit in that knot hole below this bird. It'd be a little, <laughs> yeah, it'd be right. very tight, but could almost do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if we're talking about possibilities of owls, uh, screech owls, obviously up there, but I think uh, we can dismiss it for, for the reasons Greg gave Uh great horned owl, very common across the whole of the continent. Got to be an option out there. Barred owl, another very common bird. This is going to be on the western edge of the barred owl range. Well, I mean, Arlington's in the Dallas area, so I'm sure they get yeah. a little bit further west, but not not a whole lot further west. Um, what else would be a possibility? Short-eared owl. Short-eared. Now you know uh, this 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 kind of this kind of situation is not typically what you think of for short-eared owl. But no, it's an open country have wings bird, and they can fly around and land anywhere they want. And I've certainly seen pictures of short-eared owls you know in trees like this that have confused people um yeah but short you know, owl is a very slender owl too it is uh and this it's is a, a this is a, a this is a bird. chunky this is a this chunky is. owl and the big body owl. you know and then the, there's a few things that stand out here and i mean even though the photo is is kind of blurry and distant we can still see some things um we can see that this bird has dark eyes it's got a very dark frame to the face and um it it appears to have a yellow bill or at least a light bill that it's not black um there's something going on there and um really those those dark eyes and the the, the round face without ears and that that bold frame around the face all of those things lead up to a uh, barred owl, which would be quite common in Arlington, Texas. Definitely. Barred owl is your kind of default urban, suburban owl species. Certainly screech owl. Well, large, I should say. Screech large owl can owl. be found yeah, well, in suburban are, areas. Great horned are, are... Great horned can be anywhere. Um, yeah. They, they are very Catholic in their habitat preferences. They will be in any sort of habitat in any place at any time. Uh, but a great horned owl is going to be a little more slender than this bird. It's certainly going to show, probably going to see some ear tufts here. 
um, if that's a great horned owl. And, and the face and the face pattern is a little bit different. But yeah, definitely barred owl. These things are far more common in uh, suburbia than people give them credit for. Oh, absolutely. Uh, they are they are quite thick at high densities in most places across the the southeast. Yeah, and I mean, even if this was a great horned owl with its ear tufts down, which they certainly can do, mm -hmm. um, a great horned owl has chestnut facial discs, and it, it doesn't really show that distinction between the frame on the face around the facial discs and yeah. uh, and the disc itself. It's it does have a frame, but it doesn't stand out as much as this bird. Yeah, and, it and would, you know something would have something light colored know. eyes too, which we would well, not exactly. see. And that's ex and that's, that's exactly that where I was. Yeah. That's where Sorry, I was going. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump the gun there. No, 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 that's fine. But, uh, you know, even even with things like gulls, okay, mm -hmm. where there's dark-eyed gulls and, and yellow-eyed gulls, even in distant pictures, blurry pictures, when a bird has a yellow eye or a light-colored eye, it kind of blends into the face, and it has a very different appearance when you can yeah. see the eyes clearly like this. And the dark eyes tend to, especially when they're blurred, make them look bigger Whereas mm -hmm. when the photos blurred, the yellow or light eyes make the eyes look smaller. So, yeah, good point. you know, when you see, for instance, a short billed gull standing among ring billed gulls, the eyes look huge compared mm -hmm. to the ring billed gulls. Um, yeah. And that's the case with yellow eyed versus dark eyed owls. Especially when there's light in the sky. I mean, this is obviously not complete yeah. darkness. And so, um, you know, owls, which have hypersensitive eyes for hunting, uh, at night, the pupils would be, even when there's a little bit of light, would be very small. And, yeah, we either uh, have some sunset going on here or maybe some street lamping. Mm -hmm. Yep, so barred owl. Um, barred owl. Barred owl. And, um, okay, this one comes to us from Bombay Hook, Delaware. And, um, yeah, this is, this is one of uh, the most striking um, and easily identified birds in the ABA area, but there's something about this picture that kind of is throwing people off. Um, Has it have anything to do with the fact that they can't figure out how many birds are in this picture? This image? Well, there's that. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I could see how that, you know, that, that could be an issue because we're looking at the bird with a very strong patterned uh, body, this strong black and white pattern body, and one of the heads, one of the, it looks like three birds here to me. Uh, one yeah. of the birds is uh, got his head submerged, and um, it's kind of hard to tell where the bodies begin and end uh, and on the like front bird and the middle bird. It does look like they're swimming. Yeah. Um, well, I we mean, and it certainly isn't a duck. No, it's definitely not, not a duck. We um, don't have any ducks with bills like that. There are very few birds in North America, uh, in the world, actually, in with the world. a bill like that that has that kind of strong upward uh and um yeah you, it's, a, it's a shorebird you're gonna find it in the shorebirds um this is american avocet uh yes. kind of in winter plumage although the one in the back is transitioning into summer plumage when they get this kind of gorgeous apricot colored head and neck mm -hmm. um this time of year they're they're probably in the midst of a molt so it's, it's turning this one's a little bit advanced in its molt uh compared to the other two uh but yeah the, they swim they swim sometimes. I've they seen do. them do it. Uh, they might. They might even have. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Greg. They might even have like slightly webbed feet. Like not I all the way do. webbed, not, but they have like a little slightly. bit, like halfway. I, yeah. 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 So they they're so, known to do this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, rolling right along. This one comes from Plant City, Florida. Boy, City. this is this is the this is the definition of nondescript. Yeah, no joke. Look at I that. I wish I'd taken a little bit closer look at this before we um before we started on this because I I'm probably gonna embarrass myself like I did with the, the raptor before, but Well no, nobody um, got embarrassed with the raptor because I don't think anybody <laughs> can identify. I, I do have an interesting whatever, comment. Whatever. I do have an interesting comment. <laughs> Uh, okay, that came ahead. in on YouTube from Tracy Hinchberger. Just just before we get going on this bird, she says, uh, a falconer friend said, falcon, not kestrel, kite, or peregrine. Enlarging the photo, he thinks there's a malar stripe. If it wasn't Florida, he would call it a sacar, which is a widespread old world falcon. Um, his conclusion, I don't know. So we're in good company there on that bird. If it's a sacar falcon, I mean, it's Florida, so anything's possible. Probably be a falconer's bird that was... Um, that got away that happens yeah. from, from time to time and that does happen um yeah i mean it, it it yeah i don't know so we're we're all we're all together on that one we're moving on to this bird from plant city um 
So my first impulse is blackbird. We're looking at a blackbird here. It's all over kind of plain. There's no other birds in, in North America that are kind of this all over grayish sooty brown. Um, mm -hmm. It's got kind of a long bill. That's pretty interesting there. Yep. Um, so and it's got a relatively short tail. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, it's, um, yeah, like I said, it's kind of the definition of nondescript. And if you go through the um, if you go through the field guide and go through the blackbirds, I mean, um, there's a couple that I'm kind of there's a few choices, and uh, the person who posted this had an had an interesting um, an interesting suggestion, which for that part of Florida is actually very valid, and that mm -hmm. was shiny cowbird, a female. That's shiny exactly what cowbird, I was thinking. Which yep. um, does is regular in South Florida, um, mm -hmm. but. There's a couple of things here. A shiny cowbird, especially, yeah, well, shiny female shiny cowbird is brown. It's not this kind of slate gray. Um, it shows it's it's brownish. Um, now it's been a long time since. I've seen I don't know how much you know. I don't know how much variation there is. I think if it was a young bird, it would show a little more splotchiness. Um, yeah, you know, we can rule out things like grackles and red wing blackbird and so on, because again, it's the even gray color and the pale eye or the dark eye, sorry. Um, yeah. you know, would, would rule out things. Some of the other blackbirds, um, like rusty. So, um, yeah. So I, my, my second, my backup bird, and this is the bird that I was kind of thinking right off the bat is uh brewer's blackbird. Yeah. And that's that's what uh, it's it's a female brewer's blackbird. Okay, uh, you know, well, good. if I my saw gut, this bird, my gut remains intact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the overall, this is a classic female brewer's blackbird, just yeah. all over, all over slate gray, nondescript, dark eye, kind of thin bill. Mm -hmm. If it was a brown-headed cowbird, um, the bill would be thicker, and it would show a white throat, or at least whitish. It'd show a little more stuff going on there. Um, yeah, I would think so. And, and you know, shiny cowbird, uh, the bill would be a little thicker, I would imagine, at the base yeah. especially. A, it wouldn't give the impression bit. that it was long uh, as but, this one was, which is why I thought blackbird. But it's definitely not a rusty blackbird, which is you know, rusty, more rusty brown. It makes sense. Um, I don't know where Plant City is. My guess is that it's um, in the peninsula somewhere. I, I think uh, it's but South there's, Florida. But, yeah. Um, I would think rusty. I would think Brewer's blackbird is a pretty common, uncommon, but regular uh, exactly. wintering bird in a lot of those places. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, this is a a female Brewer's blackbird. Nice, nailed it. And uh, we got a couple more here. Um, oh yeah, we're getting we're coming up against two o'clock, so we'll roll through these a little quick. We'll roll through these kind of quickly. Yeah, this one this bird's hard to see. Um, You're Tampa. Thanks, folks. Um, yep. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we can see here is it looks like it's got kind of a chunky body, kind of a long neck, kind of a long bill facing to our right. Um, mm -hmm. and kind of Bright long yellow legs. legs. You know, I can see oh, yellow legs. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. so I think that that kind of narrows and the fact that it's kind of sitting in a chair, it looks like it might be, you know, sitting in an overwater situation, maybe. Yep. Um, uh, That's all what I imagine it to be. Yeah, it, it's it, it's it's one of the herons, um, mm -hmm. and um, the the streaky underparts. Um, you know, there's there's a few species that have streaky like that. You know, the the bitterns um, mm -hmm. show that. Um, the night and, herons and night herons um, can show that. This this bird's bill looks too long and thin for a night heron. Um, I agree. Especially. And, the, dark. Uh, and and dark you know the night herons have kind of thick chunky bills and um black crown night heron has kind of a thick short neck um and this and a bird, yellowish bill and a, and a yellowish bit yeah especially in this plumage in this plumage i should say in this, yeah, this yeah. If, if it if it has streaks then it would have a yellowish bill if it was all gray on the front then it would have dark bill but um a young young black crown night heron that which was which i mean to say is that i do not believe this is a young black crown night heron no, no. The one thing that stands out to me, which is a, a field mark that that um, I like to point out every time this species comes up, is 
the bold white malar, and that is the white mm. stripe across the lower part of the face below the eye that originates at the base of the bill and goes backward. And um, that is uh, indicative of green heron, and they have it green in heron. juvenile and adult plumage. And um, a, a bittern, an American bittern, would be black there, and um, a night heron would not show that white, um, male are so distinctly mm -hmm. against the face. The face is more plain. Yeah. Uh, green heron across much of the continent is an early spring migrant. So definitely a bird that's going to be on the move right now. Um, they winter in small numbers throughout the Southern tier of, uh, of the ABA area, but they're going to be moving northward, uh, are moving northward uh, these mm -hmm. days on the coast and then later up the interior of the continent. So good, one good of, bird to be on the favorite, lookout for right now. One of my favorite birds. It was one of our birds of the year. Um, yeah. yeah, and they have an unbelievably long neck. If Google, if you're not yeah. familiar with them, Google yeah. pictures of green heron, and you'll see that like they are yeah, fifty percent body and fifty percent neck when they stick it. Yeah, out. I mean it's 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 longer when than I was most at, uh, of our uh, herons, except for things like maybe uh, tricolored and reddish egret. Yeah, when I was at Biggest Week in American Birding uh, last spring, there was a green heron singing along the uh, Maggie Marsh boardwalk. And I use the term singing uh, extremely loosely yeah. because if you've ever heard <laughs> a green heron call, it is a it is a croak that does not sound much it's like uh, any any bird. Kind of a squonk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, it was it was sitting up on top of a tree and going to town with uh, its squonky croaks, uh, one every five seconds or so <laughs> for a while. I'd never seen that before. It's pretty wild. So, uh, green heron, official songbird. You be the judge. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, this is our last one, and um, obviously a duck because it's swimming. Yeah, another swimming um, shorebird. I mean, another swimming. Ah, <laughs> oh, you um, gave it away. Jumping the gun. I'm giving it away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I just thought when I saw this picture, I thought, all right, this is cool. Um, just to yeah, show it. Yeah, it goes the with same. the avocets. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, another one. We'll kind of jump to the gun here because we're running out of time. Um, but this is, a, this is another swimming sandpiper, swimming shorebird, <laughs> and mm -hmm. which, which they can do. Um, and... I, I, you know, I've seen shorebirds uh, like Willet, like Avocet, like land way out in the water and be very yeah, yellow legs. Yeah. Be very yellow legs. Um, God, yeah. you'll be very, very confusing. Um, I would like to see what their legs are doing when they're sitting out on the water like that, because you know, have you ever seen like an underwater view of ducks and the, the feet are just kind yeah. of furiously paddling? Um, I, I can't imagine a shorebird with their long gangly legs doing that, but I guess they kind of have to. Yeah, they might Maybe. just be floating no around idea. doing their best they can. <laughs> I guess so. Aren't we all? Is but, it a metaphor um, for the rest of us? Yeah, the thing that stands out here is this bird's overall just kind of gray, dull color. Um, and uh, that that really thick, look at how thick that bill is. It's kind of stout. I think the word yeah. stout is best to describe. Yeah, for a shorebird, bird, certainly. Uh, by color, too. It uh, looks like yep. that's 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 real. The sun is uh, showing a little bit of brighter on the base of the bill than you would expect uh, to see perhaps in life for the most part, but uh, there's definitely a right bi bill base. going on there. Yeah, dark dark at the base. I mean, sorry, dark at the tip, Black. light at the base. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that, that chunky, chunky bill and the kind of it's the neck isn't short, but it isn't long, and the bird's just kind of beefy all over. All those things add mm -hmm. up to Willet. Um, yep, that's a Willet. Which is, um, uh, you can see Willet's pretty much across the ABA area. Um, mm -hmm. Year round I, I, I think, in, um, in New York, I imagine. Well, yeah. where, where it depends on where Orange County is. If that's inland a little bit, you probably don't have the eastern Willets there. Uh, it's probably Western Willet moving back to its uh, Great Plains breeding range um, in the northern United States Great Plains and, and throughout most of Can the Canadian Great Plains um, is Western Willet and Eastern Willet is a salt marsh breeding shorebird. It's a, two distinct populations that don't really overlap very much. But, you know, here on the East Coast, we get both both <laughs> at various times of the year and frequently both at the same time during spring and fall. Yeah. And, you know, Eastern Willet... Um... Uh, next time we get an eastern willet in the uh, in the group, I'll be sure to include that. But um, and, and we stockier. do get them in the in the in the in the spring and early summer. 
uh, you really, I think, you know, the, the bill of an Eastern Willet just looks, it's a crab eater. I mean, it's like starting yeah, to look, definitely. it's starting Fiddler to look kind of like yep. a Wilson's plover, you know, where they're, they're just, it's yeah. a thicker, heavier bill designed for breaking open little, little fiddler crabs and things they find on the beach. Whereas I see them, I see them searching for those mole bird. crabs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are officially out of time, but, um, we do want to say thank you to everybody uh, for Indeed. watching and let us have it. Oh, I got it. That's, 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 <laughs> yeah. You never know what side you're on. Um, yeah, if you if you enjoy these sorts of programs, please consider joining the American Birding Association. We would love to have you as a member. We are a membership organization, and as such, a lot of our um, funds, our funding, uh, comes from membership. Um, but, you know, you don't just get to... You don't just help support these sort of things. You get uh, discounts to our partners. You get our great magazines. You get a lot of cool stuff for being the, a member of the American Birding Association. Please consider joining aba.org slash join. Uh, we will be back in a couple weeks. So we'll say Chris Ortega yeah. has uh, said two uh, Western um, brown pelicans were seen in Texas. Um that's that's a good bird for Texas, though I don't I think there are a handful of uh Western brown pelican records for various parts of Texas and certainly the interior yeah, west. So, so I don't think it's yeah. like super, super rare, but definitely one of those things where you'd go, Hey, that's cool. That's that, probably no, they, yeah, on. definitely, <laughs> definitely. And it's yeah. what's well, cool that you can it's cool that you can that, that they're different enough that you can tell the difference well this time of year. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. The western ones are much more colorful. Um yeah. anyway, uh we'll be back in a couple weeks. If you want to keep appraised of when we do these things, please sign up for our Flight Calls newsletter. You can do that at aba.org. Um, otherwise, Greg, I footer. will see you in the footer. Yeah, is it in the footer? It's oh, in the, the footer. footer of the every page of the on our website. website. In the footer, join yeah. our get get signed up for our uh, get signed up for our uh, Flight Calls newsletter. Definitely. Yep. Um, thank you all for joining us. We will see you next time. Uh, enjoy spring as it slowly spreads across the ABA area. Uh, it's going to get better. It's it's not going to stay wet and nasty uh, forever. Uh, at least